So we're going from the Zelda game that I know the most about to one of the ones that I basically have no knowledge of. Wow, he really has no idea. Welcome back to the channel, guys. It's Geb here. We're coming at you with another episode of our Zelda Marathon, and we have a little bit of an interesting one to talk about today. Last time we went over Majora's Mask, and if you haven't watched that video yet, you definitely should since it's hands down my favorite Zelda game, and I had a lot to say about it in that video. I don't imagine today's video is going to approach that one in terms of length because we're talking about one of the handheld titles today, or maybe more accurately, half of one of the handheld games, because we're going to be covering The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages. Yeah, the story behind this one is actually pretty interesting, as it was Capcom of all companies that approached Nintendo with the prospect of remaking the original Legend of Zelda for the Game Boy Color with the intentions of marketing it to a younger audience. This marks the first time in the Zelda series that would have a developer outside of Nintendo since the incident. There are a few hurdles that came with this as adapting the original Zelda was seen as something that should be done because even as early as 1999, people thought that that game was too obtuse. Logistically, Capcom was finding it hard to remake this on the Game Boy Color hardware since they found the screen was too limiting for the player's view, so that's kind of where the remake idea ended. Early on in the development process, the producer for the game, Yoshiki Yakamoto, approached Shigeru Miyamoto for guidance, to which the Shigster told him to switch gears and make a trilogy of games instead, because I'm sure that was just the easier option. A trilogy of titles that all focused on something slightly different to be made by another developer, because that worked so well the first time. As you can imagine, this was quite the undertaking, since they also wanted these games to interact with each other to some degree, which they ended up utilizing a password system in order to simplify this process a little bit more. Suffice to say, this was something that proved off to be a little bit bigger than Capcom could chew, so they scaled back the project to two games, which then delayed them to something a little bit closer to the Game Boy Advance's release. Now when the Oracle games came out, they both reviewed fairly well, receiving scores in the low 90s on game rankings, with ages coming out slightly higher of the two. And then when it came to sales, combined they were the 11th best selling game on the Game Boy Color, which tells me that they were fairly popular titles at the very least. But the situation here is kind of an interesting one, because not only are these the first Zelda games that were developed by somebody outside of Nintendo that are actually worth a shit, but they're also a duology. Now before doing research for this video, I really had no idea what the situation was here. I obviously knew that the Oracle games were two separate entities, but to the degree, I wasn't sure since I've never actually played either of these games before. Was this going to be like a Pokemon situation where there are two games that are like 99% identical but have some minor UI or item changes? Or was this going to be something like Sonic 3 and Knuckles where one game takes place after the other, but they have some sort of interaction with each other to make it a full experience? Well, in a few ways, it kind of acts like both of them, but it's also something different in its own right. It's honestly kind of a weird situation, so just to help with the next few videos, the flow of these reviews is going to look like this. This video I'm going to be spending time talking about the general things that both of these games do in regards to visuals, music, gameplay, and so on. I'll also be talking about the version exclusive stuff in their respective videos, so the story and central gimmick will be something that I cover in each separate review. Since I'm getting a lot of the legwork done on the way with this first video on ages, the seasons video will also cover all of the linked content, which should in theory make them pretty comparable in length. I think this also would give a decent perspective on how these games might stand up, assuming you don't play them back to back like I did. Plus, if I'm being honest, the multiple playthroughs for the Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask videos really did kind of take a lot out of me, and I like to scale things back a little bit so I can get some videos out faster for you guys. But all that being said, I have to say, after playing Oracle of Ages, I had a pretty damn good time. I also do have to ask the question, when is this in Oracle of Seasons going to get a remake? I went into this one thinking it was going to be a decent, if unremarkable game, since I never hear people talk about the Oracle games like they do with Link's Awakening or even Minish Cap. But after playing Oracle of Ages, I found a game that almost had this weird combination of a couple different Zelda games, but also brings some new ideas to the table. Oracle of Ages is like 75% Link's Awakening, 15% original, and the remaining 10% being split between A Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time. Now while that might sound a little disappointing to some, since that brings in the question of how different this game actually is, I will say that the things that it does to stand out are done surprisingly well here. The time travel, for example, might be one of the most underrated mechanics in the series, and the puzzles are some of the most brain-teasing the franchise has seen outside of something like Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom. It's got its issues, it's got plenty of things that are done far better in other Zelda games, and if I'm being honest, I would probably put this towards the lower end of games that I've talked about so far, but I still walked away from this one having a really fun time overall. Enough so that I definitely think it should get a remake done in the style of the Switch's Link's Awakening and Echoes of Wisdom at some point in the future. But why do I think these games warrant a remake? Well, let's see. 
we have a lot to discuss today. So without further ado, this is my review for The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages. Graphics are once again up first, and like I said in my Majora's Mask video, where I thought that that game was one of the best looking titles for the N64, the same thing can be said for Oracle of Ages for the Game Boy Color. Now at a simple glance, you might look at this and say, hey, that looks like Link's Awakening. And you'd be right. A lot of the sprite work is ripped directly from that game, but given that this was released at the end of the Game Boy Color's life, you can expect there to be a few enhancements. It's nothing too crazy, some slightly more detailed characters here, some cutscenes that I think do a great job of showcasing what's possible for the GBC, but I think the big standout comes with the environments. The usage of many different vibrant colors is really what sets us apart from Link's Awakening DX. You got areas like the Overworld or Jabu Jabu's Belly in particular to show how much attention to detail Capcom put into these locations. Of course, you also have the Overworld switching mechanics for both games too. Now in Oracle of Ages, when you switch between the past and the present, you get to see a much different rendition of locations in the past, and a large part of what makes them feel so different from each other is often the change in color. Take Symmetry Town for example. Yeah, night and day difference, right? This is even more obvious when you look at Oracle of Seasons, which yeah, we're jumping a gun a bit here, but man, having four different palette swaps for the entire overworld? Yeah, you can see that's kind of a treat for the eyes, right? And that's the best way I can describe the visuals for the Oracle games. They're a treat for the eyes. For the Game Boy Color, that is. It really feels like they took the color dungeon from Link's Awakening DX and just said, let's make the whole world as vibrant as this. And I think they did a pretty overall good job with it. However, one thing I can't say that I'm 100% satisfied on is the audio design. We're back on handheld hardware with all the bleeps and bloops that you can expect of the Game Boy Color, which isn't so bad. Sound effect wise, I'd probably put it on par with Link's Awakening, which I thought sounded okay for a portable game from that time. The soundtrack is what we're really here to talk about and... Eh. Now I'm not saying this is a bad OST or anything. In fact, I think overall it's actually bigger than Link's Awakenings, but I wouldn't exactly call it better. Outside of themes such as the overworld and line of village, which keep in mind are just slightly different arrangements of pieces of music we already had in Link's Awakening, nothing here really stands out that much. I do like that some places such as again the overworld, line of village, and symmetry town have distinct themes depending on what time period you're in. Yeah, that's some really fun attention to detail, but everything else? I can't really remember it for the most part. Nothing here is bad, in fact I think everything fits the location that it's played in quite well, but compared to the heights of the series has already seen, it's just not at the same level. I know, I know, it's a Game Boy game, and unless you're Tetris or Pokemon, coming across a memorable tune from this handheld wasn't exactly the most common thing in the world. So what more can you say? The audio is fine, I suppose, for a Game Boy. Like, nothing really stands out as super bad, but nothing's really that memorable either. This kind of just gets a pass from me. I'm kind of expecting the same story when it comes to Oracle of Seasons, but hey, I guess we'll see. Now onto the story for Oracle of Ages, and having just recently played Majora's Mask and Link's Awakening, two of the best stories in the series, this one's a little bare bones. This time Link finds himself in a land called Labrina, where immediately upon his arrival, he hears a cry for help. This comes from Impa, who is currently looking for a singer in the forest. She asks Link for help, and not too long after that they find who they're looking for when they spot this blue-haired girl by the name of Nehru. After finding her, a shadow emerges from Impa and reveals herself to be Varen, a powerful sorceress who tricked Link into finding Nehru so she could possess her. She does just that, and then it's revealed that Nehru is the Oracle of Ages, and because of her possession, the flow of time has basically been fucked up to the point that Labrina is in a state of disarray. No more obvious example of this is that after Nehru's possession, a massive structure has emerged in the middle of the land called the Black Tower. Impa, now free of her possession, gives Link a sword and instructs him to head to Lina City to find the Maku Tree, which is like the Mrs. Potato Head version of the Great Deku Tree. However, Varen is aware of Link's plan and is attempting to kill the Maku Tree in a more vulnerable form in the past. Having her possess Nehru, she works to influence on the ruler of Laverna's past, Queen Ambi, and causes all the trouble that Link sees in the present. Link must travel through time and prevent this from happening and he does just that. Upon saving the Maku Tree, she instructs Link to gather the eight essences of time that are hidden across both time periods in various dungeons, and you know where this goes from here. 
After Link gets the sixth essence, he goes to Queen Ambi's castle and is actually able to exercise Varen's spear from Nehru, but she ends up possessing Queen Ambi instead, leading Link to return to his MacGuffin collecting. Then after gathering the final two essences, the Maku tree gives Link a huge Maku seed, which will allow Link to go back to the Black Tower and confront Varen. He does that and brings peace and order back to Labrina, with a final shot of Twin Rova looking on, commenting how Varen had lit the Flame of Sorrow. Eh, probably not important. So yeah, the story for Oracle of Ages is pretty bog standard for the most part. Let me get the one thing out of the way that I really like with this game's narrative first. I think the writing and focus on humor are great here. We have plenty of funny characters like Ralph, who basically acts like a Pokemon rival for how often you run into him. We have Mabel, who you constantly bump into and have to scramble to gather all of your stuff. Plus, we have tons of returning faces from Majora's Mask, such as the Happy Mask Salesman, the Toilet Hand Guy, and... him. <laughs> but they all have some pretty funny interactions. I also think the time travel storytelling is done incredibly well here too. We see so many fun instances of our actions in one time period affecting another, far more so than we did in something like Ocarina of Time, for example. My favorite examples of this would have to be when we're interacting with the Goron tribe. We have an instance where the Gorons in the past don't have any bomb flowers to blow open a rock, but because Link brings one from the present back to the past, they're not only able to open a new passageway, but they also make the bomb flowers that Link would eventually use in the present. The game is littered with segments like that, and I think those are the strongest parts of the game's story. It's also a lot like Majora's Mask structurally, where there's a lot of required activities between dungeons that really do add some extra character to the whole thing, which I think is a huge bonus. However, that's all I really have to say when it comes to stuff that I liked about this story. Now, nothing here is bad by any means, but everything here just doesn't really matter too much. We have a new setting again being Labrina, but outside of just wanting to have a little bit more original lore with Queen Ambi, I don't really see what makes this place so different from Hyrule. Like, two of the best Zelda games, in my opinion, are Majora's Mask and Link's Awakening, both of which have us removed from Hyrule, but give us some real reasons to be interested in the land itself. Labrina really doesn't have any defining features that makes it stand out all that much. We still have the Gorons in the mountains, and the Zora having their city accessible only through water. We do have a new race of people called the Toke, who are just some lizard folk that steals Link's shit. But that's kind of where it begins and ends. Our characters here aren't the craziest thing in the world either. Link is the same as ever, Impa takes a bit more of an active role in the story, which is nice. Nehru is fine, I guess, she doesn't really do much after we save her. Ralph is pretty funny, but doesn't really impact the plot all that much. Queen Ambi is just sort of okay too, I suppose. She's just basically another means for Varen exerting her control. And then when it comes to Varen herself, eh, one of the most one-note villains in the franchise. She's no Ganon, she's no Majora, hell, she's not even Vatty, but she gets the job done, so it's whatever. Yeah, and that's the best way I can really describe the story in this game. It just sort of gets the job done. It's not god-awful or anything, and there were a few pieces of writing that really did get a chuckle out of me, so I can't hate it too much. That being said, I recognize that I'm only experiencing half the story here because I need to go through a linked playthrough of Seasons in order to get the true ending, so I guess we'll see if things pick up there. I doubt it, but we'll see. If the past few sections of this video seemed a little bit more on the negative side, I think the next couple are going to be a little bit of a change of pace. Starting off with the general gameplay here, and I just have one question. Did you like the general gameplay for Link's Awakening? Well, if you did, you're probably going to have a pretty good time with the Oracle games, and if you didn't... Sorry. <laughs> The overall gameplay picks up basically where Link's Awakening left off. It's essentially the same situation as Ocarina of Time to Majora's Mask or Breath of the Wild to Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, there might be a couple small enhancements here and there to the overall feel, but it's like 99% the same thing, so you can basically take everything I said about Link's Awakening in my video on that game, link up top, and apply it here. This unfortunately also accounts for the inventory management, which I honestly think could actually be a little bit more egregious here with certain boss fights than it was in Link's Awakening. When it comes to your inventory this time around, I think we again have a pretty decent overall lineup, though I did think it was weird for us not to have the bow this go around. Has there been any other game outside of Zelda 2 that hasn't had one? Anyways. We see the return of stuff that you might expect, like bombs, the power glove, the shovel, the rock's feather, a nerfed version of the boomerang, and we also see the cane of Samaria come back from A Link to the Past, and it gets some more use here, which is great to see. You can even use it to help you find your way in the dark, which I actually do like. When it comes to new items, we only have a few to go over. First, we have the flute of various animal companions that Link can get. Yeah, early on in the game, Link will help out each of these guys, and then you can briefly ride them to get past some obstacles, but later on, he needs to make a choice on which one he wants to stick with. This alters an area in Overworld to account who you pick for this, but beyond that, this choice doesn't really do too much since you only need them for like one section of the game. 
I chose Dimitri because I can't wait to ride some Dodongos. Probably one of the coolest new items we get involves the seeds with the seed bag and the seed launcher. Now on your journey, Link will find these seed trees that he can smack to earn a new type of seed. Ember seeds for lighting stuff on fire, scent seeds for attracting enemies, Pegasus seeds that will give Link a boost in speed or stop enemies in their tracks, Gale seeds that can either be used to blow enemies away or warp Link to a previously visited location, and mystery seeds that are basically only worth using for owl statues or this boss fight against Varen. You can use these straight out of the bag or by getting the launcher later in the game you can fire them like projectiles to damage enemies or hit switches. These are super versatile and are easily the best addition inventory wise. After that we have the mermaid suit. I hate this thing. This lets Link dive underwater, which is cool for some levels, but it also completely changes his swimming controls. Now you have to rapidly press the directional button to move that way, and in some dungeons like Jabu Jabu's Belly, you will start to feel your thumb get sore for how often you'll be needing to do this. It's seriously awful, I don't know why they made this change. Next up we have the switch hook, which is basically the hook shot, but now we'll switch places with the item or enemy that Link grabs a hold of. This is honestly a really cool mechanic, and has a ton of application for puzzle use, so I'm a big fan of this. And finally there's the Harp of Ages, which I'll get into a little bit more detail on during the time travel portion of this video. You'll get all of these throughout the game's dungeons, which there's a lot this time around. 8 main dungeons, 2 mini dungeons, and 1 final dungeon for this game. I won't go over all of them, mainly because I think the 3D dungeons are infinitely more interesting than the 2D ones, but I will say, I think they're overall a step up from the ones that we saw in A Link to the Past or Link's Awakening. I did feel like a lot of them went on for a little too long, especially like Jabu Jabu's Belly or Ancient Tomb. Those are some confusing ass dungeons that took me almost an hour each to finish, so they can be a little exhausting. Actually Jabu Jabu's Belly gets a special mention as the worst dungeon in my eyes, since it basically combines all the worst thing about it Ocarina of Time version, but adds a changing water levels mechanic from the water temple. Also, who the fuck keeps making these Vor dungeons? They're weird and gross, stop it. Something else that I did find a little exhausting was just the sheer amount of stuff that you needed to do in between the dungeons. Now I said before that I like not having to do dungeon spam and have some unique activities here and there, but I think this game went a little too overboard at points. I'm mainly talking about the minigame trek with the Gorons about halfway through the game. Now I like me some mini games, but I'm not a big fan of making them something that's mandatory for story completion, especially when those mini games suck. Looking at you Goran dancing minigame, this is just straight up awful and it took me so many tries just to get the timing down. I also wasn't a big fan of revisiting the Lost Wood type area, since it just had you do the same gimmick again, just to find your animal pal. But overall, general gameplay is some pretty solid stuff. We have a lot of stuff essentially returning from A Link to the Past, and hey, if you're like me and you really enjoyed that game, I think you'll find a lot of stuff to really like here too. Now we move on to the side content, and would you believe me if I told you there wasn't really that much to cover? <laughs> Let's go over the most interesting thing first, the ring collecting. So throughout Link's quest, he will occasionally come across some rings either by exploration, getting them from a seed, or by winning minigames. These rings start out as a complete mystery, but you can bring them to this guy and have them appraised, where he will tell you what effect that ring will have when you equip it. You can initially only equip one at a time, but later on you can get a higher tier ring box that lets you equip more. Now, not all these rings are useful, in fact, there's a lot of them that just act as a reward for completing something else that have no practical use. You do also have some more situational ones that aren't super spectacular, but might be worth considering if you have an extra slot. There's some that stop you from slipping on ice, some that prevent you from falling through breakable floors, some that nullify electricity, you know, super niche uses. Then you have your heavy hitters, the rings that reduce incoming damage, make Link have more powerful sword swings, or the ones that gradually heal Link over time. These are the ones that you'll probably always have equipped, and I can't say I blame you if you just use these the entire game. If you want to switch rings out, you need to go back to town to talk to this guy, which means a lot of those niche rings that I might have been interested in using either require backtracking or the best foresight in the world in order to make them even worth considering. Overall, this is an okay system. It kind of gives you some light RPG aspects, which is kind of cool. But man, if you could switch these out on the fly, I think they would really have something here. Outside of that, we got some stuff you might expect to be standard now. Heart pieces to collect to increase your health, and plenty of mini games to do, with probably the most notable one being this baseball challenge. Yeah, I don't know, I didn't really care for the mini games this go around. We also see the return of the big trading side quest again, and this one is probably the most batshit insane one yet. You give a dog a mask because the owner thinks it's ugly. You have this guy rip off his mustache to give it to someone else. You tell this depressed guy a joke to cheer him up. You have the hand from Majora's Mask give you a bag of actual shit as part of the whole thing. It gets fucking weird. 
It's all for a sword upgrade though, and you actually have a few instances where you can upgrade other things like your shield or your bomb carrying capacity too. We don't have the collectible shells this time unfortunately, instead we get these little things called Gasha Seeds. The way that these seeds work is that you find them throughout your quest, and then you can plant them in some select locations in the overworld. Then you go to these spots after a while, and you can harvest these seeds to get a randomized prize. Which can be anything from a new ring, to rupees, to even a piece of heart. Yep, you have a piece of heart locked behind pure luck with these, so I didn't waste my time trying to get it. I only did these when I was already passing through an area and didn't focus on them too much. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan of the Gasha Seed mechanic. I just realized they're called Gasha Seeds. That's basically all she wrote when it comes to the side content, though. But now I want to shift gears into our two main gameplay gimmicks, because while I've been a little bit back and forth on Oracle of Ages, these next two sections, I pretty much have nothing but positive things to say. So the first of these two mechanics that I want to go over is time travel, and yes, this is the third game in a row that's had some time traversal mechanic, and you can probably imagine I'm getting a little bit sick of it by now, but believe it or not, I think it's done really well here, and debatably, it's done better in Oracle of Ages than it was in Ocarina of Time. Yeah, how's that spicy take for you? But it's true, I think the switching back and forth between two time periods is better implemented and better realized here than it was in what's often considered to be one of the best games in the series. So how does it work? Well, there are essentially two overworlds, being the present and the past. Early on in the game, Link is given an item called the Harp of Ages that will essentially let him activate these portals, which he can go into to travel back and forth between the two time periods. Think of these like the portals to the Dark World and A Link to the Past and how they function. While also like A Link to the Past, about midway through the game, we learn a new song for the Harp that basically operates like the magic mirror in that game, where you can warp to the past at any point, leaving a temporary portal behind that you can enter to re-emerge in the present. But it even goes one step beyond that because later in the game, you get another song that lets you switch back and forth at will. This makes it an even more flexible mechanic than what we saw in A Link to the Past, and it kind of makes it how I wanted things to operate in Ocarina of Time. Being able to switch between the past and the present with the push of a button makes for some incredibly fun and interesting situations. You have some basic stuff like pushing a seed to a spot in the past that will turn into a vine wall in the present, but you also have some sections where you earn a symbol of trust from the Gorons in the present that you can bring to the past to access a new area. This game has so many fun little pieces of interplay between the two time periods. Like one of my favorites are when you're in the ocean area, and when you go back and forth between the past and the present, the islands will actually have shifted to show the movements of the tectonic plates, which is such a cool fucking idea. It's also how you traverse the area to meet with the Zoras since the ocean is poisoned, and switching back and forth between the time periods will have the current move the toxic water to different areas. I'm also a big fan of the Mermaid's Cave Dungeon, given that you need to do part of it in the past and part of it in the present in order to progress through the dungeon, which I think is a more realized version of the Spirit Temple. And there are a ton of other examples of various things that you can do by switching the time periods back and forth throughout the game. In the interest of keeping things brief, I'll just say that Oracle of Ages really took the Dark World mechanic from A Link to the Past and the time travel mechanic from Ocarina of Time and combined them in a way that makes it one of the most underrated mechanics in the Zelda franchise. I love it, it's easily the best part about this game. Now the other big thing that Oracle of Ages focuses on is the puzzles. And I know what you're thinking, hey Geb, doesn't every Zelda game focus on puzzles? And yeah, that's technically true, but I don't think any other Zelda game has much of a focus on puzzles as Oracle of Ages does. Now Zelda games really had three stages of puzzle before this game came along. You had the early games like Zelda 1 and 2 that were mainly focused on giving not so clear hints, and these puzzles were usually solved by taking random stabs in the dark. Some of the other 2D games like A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening had puzzles, but they were more focused on interacting with a weird spot of the environment like pushing a block or flipping a switch to raise or lower a set of walls. And then there's the 3D games that really elevated the puzzles by making more common usage of things such as light reflection, lighting torches, raising water levels, moving central platforms to get to new areas, you know, the stuff that we now mostly associate with Zelda puzzles. This is also where we see the dungeon item be used as the primary key for defeating the dungeon boss. Oracle of Ages essentially has a hybrid of the 2D formula established in Link's Awakening, but it takes a lot of design cues from Ocarina of Time as well to make some of the most brain-teasing and challenging puzzles that the series has ever seen. Let me give you an example. So when Link visits Crescent Island for the first time, he will have his inventory stripped of him and he will have to recover it little bit by little bit by solving puzzles baked into the environment on the island. 
Eventually, there's a shot that he can trade one of his items for another, which means that he'll have to navigate back and forth, opening up new pathways around the island in order to get all of his stuff back. Well, except if you brought a shield, they just straight up take that shit with no way of getting it back. But regardless, this is a really fucking cool section of the game. And the overworld has a ton of different stuff like this in between dungeons, most of it typically being related to time travel, so these two things really go hand in hand with each other. And then there's the dungeons themselves, which... These have some of the most difficult puzzles in the series, by far. And then there's the dungeons themselves, which... These definitely have some of the most difficult puzzles in the series, by far. You know, even with all the development of puzzles in the series, a lot of it can really be boiled down to just using an item on something, pushing a block, or flipping a switch. Oracle of Ages definitely breaks that mold by having a bunch of dungeon puzzles test the player on their memory, their foresight, and their logic capabilities. One of my favorite examples are the puzzles that have Link push a block to a certain area, but all the blocks of the same color will move in the same direction. This means Link will have to impair the movements of some blocks while he moves others to get them in place. Or how about these puzzles that have Link light up squares on the floor, but he can't go over any previous ones? Or how about these block rolling ones that essentially act like solving a Rubik's Cube? Or how about these ones where Link has to memorize the directions while he's walking over an invisible floor? Then comes the bosses, which no boss from this game is going to win any awards or anything, but I do appreciate the design philosophy of making them a lot more puzzle-focused encounters rather than just straight up combat from Link's Awakening, especially since most of the bosses in that game were a complete fucking joke. So as you can see, this game is chalked to the brim with puzzles, and as someone who really enjoys puzzles, I'm all about this. If you, however, are not a puzzle fan, I don't think there's going to be anything in this game that's really going to convince you otherwise. If you're really not a puzzle fan, I don't think there's going to be anything in this game that's going to change your mind, though. That being said, outside of Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, I think this might be one of the overall best games in the series when it comes to testing your brain. So this video may have come off a little bit more critical than my last few, but let me just stress again, I think Oracle of Ages is a great game. Coming off of playing A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, Ocarina of Time, and Majora's Mask is a really tough act to follow. Those are just some of the best games ever made, not just Zelda games. But Oracle of Ages surprised me, and I had a pretty damn good time with my playthrough. Yeah, it's not the most original Zelda game, and the story is sort of nothing, and there are some issues I had with Link's Awakening that are still here, but there was enough here that I was able to keep myself entertained throughout my playthrough. I loved the time travel mechanics, the emphasis on puzzles provided a challenge unlike anything seen before in a Zelda game, and there were even some cool ideas here like equipping the rings, which I think were revisited to a greater effect later on with things like Breath of the Wild's armor system. I think that there's a lot that can be done here, and if this and Seasons got the Link's Awakening remake treatment, I would more than happily play them again. Overall, I think I can pretty safely recommend Oracle of Ages for anyone looking to get more of that classic 2D Zelda feel. It's not my favorite game in the series, but I think it's something you should definitely consider checking out. Ah, but this is only one half of the story when it comes to the Oracle games. Next time, we're going to be playing Oracle of Seasons, and we're going to be doing our linked playthrough there to get the complete experience, whatever that might look like, so you guys aren't going to want to miss out on that. But that's all the time I have for you guys today. Thank you for watching. What was your favorite memory of The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages? Please be sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section down below. And hey, if you enjoyed today's video, maybe consider giving a like and subscribing. Thank you guys again. I'll catch you in the next video.